I'm really honored to be here to talk about a topic that is so um, near and dear to my heart, stage four cancer. And the question is, you know, with all the advances that we have seen in the past decade, are we really winning the battle? Where are we? Where is the, um, the field of cancer medicine at this juncture? And I'm going to give you some um, details about what we know so far and what we have learned so far. And I believe we have some MOC questions to go through. Um, are we doing that or we can skip the questions? Okay, all right, so let's go through the questions really quickly. Okay, all right, so um, I'm going to briefly um, talk about some cancer statistics, you know, the recent cancer statistics. And I'm going to use melanoma as a model to talk about genomics um, and precision medicine. And then specifically also kind of bring this to colorectal cancer and how all of this is kind of linked. You know, cancer care, um, we learn from one disease process and are able to apply to another disease process. And we'll kind of understand this together and I hope to give you some interesting tidbits as we go along. Now, the incidence of cancer, so, so this is the data um, from 2008 to 2015. And if you look at um, the incidence of all male cancers, the top three cancers continue to be prostate, lung and bronchus, as well as colon and rectum. And the incidence of all three cancers have been steadily decreasing over the past five years. Um, and overall, you know, the seven out of 17 cancer incidences have also been decreasing, and this is the top three cancer. But then if you look at it, uh, melanoma of the skin, the incidence has actually gone up uh, in the past five years, you know, probably due to the sun exposure during the early 70s and 80s with lack of adequate sun protection. And we are probably seeing the aftermath of sun exposure now where we, we do see um, um, probably the mid 60s coming in with um, melanoma. Now, when we specifically look at the incidence of cancers in female, um, the top three cancers are breast, lung, and bronchus, and colon and rectum. Um, lung and bronchus, colon and rectum incidents are going down. Breast and um, uterine cancers have gone up. And similar to men, the incidence of melanoma also is steadily going up. You know, we have a 1.2% annual percentage change. But when we look at specifically the mortality for cancers and um, looking at male cancers, all top three cancers um, the mortality rate has gone down in the past five years. You know, 3.8% decrease in lung and bronchus cancer, and we can talk about how genomics has really influenced the outcome in lung and bronchus cancer, prostate cancer, colon and rectal cancer, and we will we'll talk more about colon and rectum cancer specifically. And also, despite the increased incidence in melanoma, um, the mortality rate for melanoma has gone down. And again, I hope to elucidate some really important discoveries during um, this past decade that really has influenced the outcome in melanoma. And the mortality rates in female, the top three cancers, our mortality rates have gone down, including melanoma of the skin. So very similar kind of trends. Now, overall, when we look at the overall incidence of cancer, you know, on the left panel, you have the adjusted incidence. The, a, the average annual uh, percentage change is in the negative for men, which means that the annual incidence is actually decreasing in men for all cancers. Uh, there is no change in females, so the change is actually zero in females, so the incidence has remained steady in females. However, the mortality in both men as well as women have gone down in the past five years with an annual change of about 1.8% in men, and between 2000 to 2015, a change of about 1.4% in women. So overall, the mortality has gone down uh, for all cancers, both in men and women. Now, why is this? Why is this? You know, we can talk about the possi possibly the improvement in cancer care without talking about genomics and precision medicine in this decade. Now, precision medicine, as defined by National Institute of Health, is an emerging approach for disease treatment and prevention, taking into account individual variability in environment, lifestyle, and genes in each person, not just in a big population, but in individual person, where we bring in genetic variability as well as epigenomics, where there is epigenetic variations on top of the gene alterations as well that is influenced by a person's health um, 
lifestyle as well as environment. So all of this is applicable when we talk about precision medicine. Now, melanoma is a great cancer model to talk about genomics and precision medicine. Now, this is, um, again, from, 2000, um, uh, from 1999 to 2015 data, specifically showing, um, once again, on the um, left side, you have the increasing incidence shown by the red lines, as well as the mortality rates shown by the, um, the blue line. And, um, and then if you look at specifically the uh, mortality rate for stage four melanoma, it's about 16, I mean, sorry, the survival for stage four melanoma, it's about 16%. It's unheard of, you know. Melanomas are such deadly cancers. For stage four patients to have a five-year survival of 16% is actually quite impressive. Um, and this is only going to go up. You know, this is just the beginning of immune therapy, and we will talk more about it. But however, this rate of five-year survival is going to steadily go up for stage four melanoma. Now, how, why, can't, why is this possible? You know, and it is important to know about the genomic evolution of melanoma. Melanoma starts off as a, as a nevus, and then it progresses into dysplastic nevus. There are mutations that are accumulated in this stage. But as melanoma progresses into malignant melanoma and then into metastatic melanoma, there is increased accumulation of pathogenic mutations and non-synonymous point mutations. As shown here, when you look at the mutation signature, um, there are increased copy number variations, and the uh, extent of it goes up with metastatic melanoma, and so are the point mutations. So when there is more mutations in a particular cancer, it results in formation of new antigens, as, as you can see. So mutation results in new antigens. New antigens then attract immune cells. And there is, these cancers are higher immunogenic, um, they're attracting immune cells, and, and they're also immune responsive. And this concept is actually known. You know, we know about tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in melanoma for the longest time. Pathologists used to report tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and the prognostic significance of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes have been known. You know, when there is more lymphocytes, the patient tends to do better, um, right? So, but not always. You know, we also know that sometimes these lymphocytes are not doing their job. Um, so the question, actually the billion dollar question is that if lymphocytes are actually present in the tumor, why are they not killing the cancer cells? Why are they not doing their job? What is stopping them from actually acting against these cancer cells that shows so many new antigens because of higher mutational burden? This takes us to the immune checkpoint pathways. Now, we know about immune checkpoint pathways. You know, this is what prevents autoimmunity so that our own lymphocytes don't act on our own cells, right? So activation of T cells is a multi-step process. And the immune checkpoint pathways control the activation of T cells to prevent autoimmunity. And this is the process of peripheral tolerance. We have central tolerance that happens in thymus, but the peripheral tolerance that happens you know, in lymph nodes and in tissues. right? And the two important immune checkpoint pathways are the cytotoxic T lymphocyte-associated antigen 4, CTLA-4, um, and the program death 1. So these two are very important immune checkpoint pathways that control T cell activation. Now, what does that have to do with melanoma? Um, well, we will understand CTLA-4 pathway and see as to how that applies to melanoma. Now, CTLA-4 pathway is an early immune checkpoint. It happens in lymph nodes where CTLA binding results in uh, inhibition of T cell proliferation and survival. So in this cartoon, um, so it really shows when the antigen presenting cell presents the antigen, you know, using the major histocompatibility complex to the T cell receptor, the T cell is activated by co-stimulation by the B7 and CD28 binding. So this results in a net positive signal and causes T cell proliferation, increased survival of the T cells, and IL-2 production. However, when there is a strong signal, the CTLA-4, which is an immune checkpoint molecule, can be expressed on the surface. It competes with the CD28 for the B7 binding. When CTLA-4 binds to B7, it creates a negative signal, and the T cells are no longer, you know, um, so it, it is not active. It results in energy and does not fight against the cancer cells, reduce IL-2 production, 
reduce proliferation and reduce survival. So the CTLA-4 expression and its co competition to bind with B7 results in breaking the T cells from working. So that is very important to know that this is why even though the T cells are present, if they cannot really act on, uh, or if they can't really do the cytotoxic activity because CTLA-4 stops them from doing it, even if they are present, they are not doing their jobs. Sorry about that. And the programmed death one pathway is another checkpoint pathway. It's a late checkpoint. It occurs in peripheral tissues. It also is very similar to the CTLA-4 because it, is, it belongs to that CD28B7 homolog. And binding of it will also inhibit T cell um, activation and proliferation. So in this cartoon, you know, here PD-1. So PD-1 is a programmed death. It is expressed on the T cell um, surface. When the PD-1 is unbound and um, you have the T cells, you know, working with the uh, antigen expressed on the major histocompatibility complex, and this is a tumor cell expressing its antigen, and the T cells are working, there is a positive signal, results in interferon gamma production. But when, when the tumor cells see this, they produce a ligand called as PDL1. And the PDL1 is now expressed on the surface of the tumor cell. And the PDL1 will then go on to bind to PD1. And binding of the PDL1 to PD1 then results in a negative signal, so results in energy of the T cell, and the T cell no longer can proliferate or reduce cytokine production and reduces the survival of T cell. So tumor cells are very clever in producing PDL1. There are several tumors that does this, and when it binds to the PD1 that is expressed in the T cell, it actually stops the T cells from working. So even though we have our lymphocytes in the tumor tissue, it no longer can act because it is stopped um, by this negative signal that is produced by the binding of PDL1 and PD1 or CTLA4 to B7. Now, checkpoint inhibition, this whole concept of how do we inhibit the checkpoint pathways um, is, is what has led to the discovery of some very, very important drugs, and I'll show you the data on those drugs. So checkpoint inhibition constitutes of two. One is the anti-CTLA-4, as I showed. Um, so these are monoclonal antibodies that are um, completely humanized monoclonal antibodies that bind to the CTLA-4. So the CTLA-4 no longer is competing with the B7 um, or with the CD28 for the B7 binding. So the, the T cells can remain active. It's because the CTLA-4 break has been stopped or has been eliminated. So that is one way of immune checkpoint inhibition. And the second is this anti-PD-1, where, again, a monoclonal antibody that is directed against this PD-1 receptor. So the PD-1 is actually blocked and does not bind with the PD-L1. There can also be antibodies to the PD-L1 itself. So essentially, you're kind of blocking this interaction between PD-L1 and PD-1. So that uh, break is also removed, resulting in T cell activation. So these are two very important checkpoint inhibition pathways that have come, come about with all of this discovery of why T cells don't do their job in tumor tissues even when they are present. So the checkpoint inhibition. Now, now there are Nobel Prize winners because they discovered this. Um, and these are two Nobel Prize winners uh, for 2018, Dr. James Allison, who is a professor of immunology in MD Anderson Cancer Center, who discovered CTLA-4, and Dr. Hanjo, who is also a professor of immunology and genomics in Kyoto University, Japan, who discovered PD-1. And these, they shared a Nobel Prize for medicine in 2018 for the discovery of these immune checkpoint pathways. Um, very, very important discovery. I think it has completely changed how we care for cancer patients. And without understanding genomics, you know, it's impossible to take care of cancer um, patients at this point. Now, when it came to using this particular drug, so the checkpoint inhibitor, the CTLA-4, um, this is the first drug that came to randomized control trial, um, and this is ipilimumab. All these names are tongue twisters, actually. You know, we have to practice them to actually say them correctly. So ipilimumab was the first agent that was used in metastatic melanoma. Uh, this study was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2010, a landmark article by Dr. Hody et al. And uh, what they showed is that ipilimumab, when compared to GP100 peptide vaccine, 
improved median survival in metastatic melanoma. After a very, very long time, you're talking about decades, um, we now have a drug that could improve median survival in metastatic melanoma. And this is remarkable. This changed everything for melanoma care, not just melanoma, but for the entire cancer care. This was followed um, by, you know, um, Dr. Wulchak was looking at the dose-dependent effects of uh, ipilimumab and demonstrated that the um, effect of ipilimumab is dose-dependent. So 10 milligram dose was better than the 3 milligram dose. So they were using higher doses. And then this was followed by another large randomized control trial. Now you can think about it, the, the rapidity with which these randomized control trials are being published in New England Journal of Medicine. And this was all driven by pharmaceutical companies. And ipilimumab is a drug um, from Bristol-Myers Squibb. And they were able to sponsor these international um, randomized control trials. And only pharma can do that. I mean, that's just millions and millions of dollars put into, put into clinical trials. And this, was, this trial was sponsored by Bristol-Myers Squibb because ipilimumab was their drug. And they looked at ipilimumab in metastatic melanoma. And they were able to demonstrate, you know, as shown here, this is a Kaplan-Myers survival curve. The control arm was a standard dacarbacin, and this was ipilimumab plus dacarbacin, and they had improved overall survival, 11.2 versus 9.1 months, statistically significant survival improvement in patients treated with the CTLA-4 inhibitor. Again, you, you'll say that that's a small difference in the median um, survival, the number of months, but this was sufficient for FDA to approve ipilimumab for the management of metastatic melanoma. However, this came with some price. Um, the grade three, four adverse events in patients who received ipilimumab plus dacarbacin was 56.3%, and there were also deaths in these patients, um, versus 27.5% in the control arm. So there was a serious toxicity associated with checkpoint inhibition, almost unacceptable at this dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram. And this was followed by another drug which is also from Merck. Merck is another big pharmaceutical company, as you all know. And this drug was uh, Merck's drug, PD-1 inhibitor, which is a pembrolizumab. Um, and they came out with a clinical trial, once again published in New England Journal of Medicine, compared pembro to ipilimumab in advanced melanoma. Um, and they were once again able to show improved progression-free survival and improved overall survival for pembro. So PEMBRO is a PD-1 inhibitor. And this is also another landmark study that showed that with checkpoint inhibition, the CTLA-4 inhibition, which is the early immune checkpoint, is effective. But however, the later inhibition that happens in the tumoral tissue itself is more significant. Um, um, so this, this was an important study that came out um, in 2015. They were also able to show not only uh, PD-1 inhibition was beneficial and better than CTLA-4 inhibition in metastatic melanoma, the adverse events were also much lower in the pembrolizumab group. Um, so now we really have a drug that is useful in metastatic melanoma, again, unusual, um, with lower toxicity than what, what one was demonstrated in 2011. And this essentially kind of killed um, single-agent ipilimumab. There was no more role for single-agent ipilimumab because you have a better drug which does the same thing with less toxicity. And this was followed, you know, again, pharmaceutical companies. Um, it has to follow. So Merck did their job. Bristol-Myers came up with another drug, which is also a PD-1 inhibitor, again, showing pre pretty much similar results that um, the PD-1 inhibitor combination was better than the CTLA-4 inhibition. Um, but however, all of this opened up the doors for checkpoint inhibition, not just in melanoma, but in overall in cancer, um, gastric cancer, ovarian cancer, and we understand lung cancer. Um, so the checkpoint inhibition uh, was, inhibitors were approved by FDA um, in 2011-15, um, and we have um, Ipilimumab was the um, CTLA-4 inhibitor, and the Pembro and Nivolumumab uh, were um, the PD-1 inhibitors that were um, approved in 2015. And they are now available for treatment for all sorts of cancers. You know, any cancer that has immune response um, seen in the tumor, could, you could potentially consider them 
um, as a candidate for PD-1 inhibition. Now, along the same line, uh, there was also additional discoveries that were happening. We understand that uh, melanoma has tumor mutations. And one of the most important mutations that we found was the BRAF V600E mutation. This was also happening at the same time when immune checkpoint inhibition was uh, being discovered. 50% of metastatic melanoma will harbor BRAF mutation. So this is a mutation that drives the MAP kinase pathways. MAP kinase pathway is a carcinogenic pathway. And this driver mutation actually drives carcinogenesis. So the question is, can we inhibit this driving pathway? If a patient has BRAF mutation, can we stop it? And can we come up with a drug that does that? As shown here, you know, majority of BRAF mutation is actually V600E mutation. And they came up with inhibitors, very precise inhibitors that specifically target MAP kinase pathway. And we have two agents, vimurafenib and dabrafenib, for as a BRAF inhibitor. And the MEK inhibitors are trametinib and cobimetinib. And these are the downstream inhibitors of the MAP kinase pathway. Um, and these inhibitors came about, and in BRAF V600E mutation patients with unresectable metastatic melanoma, we once again um, have a drug, which is bemurafenib, that showed improved survival. And um, here you can see the significant difference in the survival curves between the standard arm, which is dacarbacin, and bemurafenib. Again, precision medicine targeting a very specific mutation in a cancer can result in prolonged and improved survival. And this is single agent bemurafenib. So the patients are not getting systemic therapy, uh, other cytotoxic chemotherapy agents. They are getting a single agent, targeted agent that is specific for that cancer in that patient. And we are able to show um, improved overall survival and improved um, progression-free survival as well. And so uh, once again, this again was an important discovery um, in uh, cancer uh, treatment. The response rates were also excellent, as shown here. The size of the target lesions, this is a waterfall plot, demonstrating that patients treated with bemurafenib, their target lesion size was significantly and progressively decreased over the course of their treatment. Again, a very effective drug. So think about a patient who has a brain met and is able to get this kind of a treatment because they have VRAF V600E mutation, and you're able to show or can achieve significant reduction in their target size. You know, that's remarkable in metastatic melanoma because metastatic melanoma tends to go to brain quite often. Again, the combination drugs, um, which is BRAF and MEK, also pretty much showed um, the same results where the combination was definitely better than the single agent. And so the BRAF-MEK combination is now often used in patients with metastatic melanoma after the single agent PD-1 inhibition uh, if they are BRAF uh, mutated. So this shows kind of where we were and where we are now. So from 1975, where we had a single agent, dacarbacin, um, to 2000, where we had high-dose interleukin, and that's all the agents we had for treatment of metastatic melanoma, to a plethora of agents, very specific targeted agents that were approved by FDA between 2011 and 2015, and the combination agents that have been shown to be effective in metastatic melanoma, a very hard disease to treat. And now we have so many specific agents to address this that have all been shown to improve overall survival and progression-free survival with reasonable toxicity profile. Now, switching gears a bit, you know, so we understand genomic medicine. Um, and we do understand that targeting specific driver mutations will change um, a patient's cancer progression. Um, and knowing what those driver mutations are in an individual patient is extremely critical um, when we think about systemic treatment for them. Now, in terms of colon and rectum cancer, you know, um, when we look at the stages at which patients are diagnosed, you know, it's equally distributed from stage one to stage four. About 20% of patients get diagnosed with stage four colorectal cancer. So they do have metastasis at the time of original presentation. Um, and as you can see here, 12.6% is the overall five-year survival for stage four patients. Now, I want to talk more about what specifically has changed. You know, if you specifically look at what is the survival for stage four colorectal cancer patients. Uh, this is an interesting study 
that was um, presented or, or published in Journal of Clinical Oncology by Dr. Kopitz, and they looked at patients enrolled in clinical trials from 1996, okay, 1996 to 2008. And you, you can see there is a progressive increase in survival uh, as shown here, the, the five-year overall survival. There is a significant upward trend um, towards survival, and when we come to 2004 to 2008, it's almost above around close to 35% for patients enrolled in clinical trials. Um, and this shows you know, improvement not just in the overall care of the patient, but also the specific treatments that we have available for these patients. Now, the colon rectum cancer, we now understand certain um, differences. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have taken care of colon cancer, and we used to think colon cancers are the same, whether it comes from the right side or the left side. We now know that the right colon cancer is very different from the left colon cancer. Um, so you can't treat them the same way. Right side is different from the left side. Um, you know, and there are a lot of theories as to why right is different from left. Um, because of embryological origin, the type of cancers that they develop, and the type of mutations seen in right colon cancer compared to left colon cancer. The other uh, things that we have learned for colon and rectum cancer is understanding, once again, the genomic differences, the mutational status of a specific cancer, BRAF mutation, RAS mutations, and also microsatellite instability. Microsatellite instability increases the tumor's mutational burden um, and changes what treatment you're going to use for these patients. And then we do have targeted therapy specifically for BRAF mutation, MSI, um, which would be PD-1 inhibition. We'll talk about that. And then I want to also address hepatic metastasis and peritoneal carcinomatosis. Now, right and left colon cancer, as I mentioned, they are distinct biologic entities. Um, right colon cancer tend to have a higher frequency of microsatellite instability. They also have higher frequency of BRAF mutations, and they tend to harbor more of mucinous tumors Whereas the left-sided cancers tend to have non-mucinous tumors. Again, the way that these cancers behave are very different. And right-sided um, cancers tend to have poorer survival. Um, and this has been shown in multiple studies. We specifically looked at the association of primary tumor site and mortality in patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. Um, this is an, um, an article that was published in JAMA Surgery so we looked at nearly 8,000 patients from California Cancer Registry, and um, we specifically focused on patients between right side and left side receiving systemic treatment. And what we showed is this right-sided colon cancer patients represented by this line are patients who were treated with a particular agent called a cetuximab. Cetuximab is an EGFR inhibitor. So it's an epidermal growth factor inhibitor. Uh, it's a monoclonal antibody that is specifically targets it. Um, and we found that those patients actually did poorly when compared to all of the left-sided patients, you know, whether it is treatment with bevacizumab or cetuximab. And certainly these patients did poorly. Um, what that means is that right-sided colon cancer has different mutations that allow for it to continue to grow despite EGFR inhibition and certainly should not be considered um, in patients with right sided colon cancer. NCCN actually changed their guidelines to represent this change. So right sided colon cancer patients are excluded from receiving EGFR inhibitors. Now, you know, of course we have so many drugs, but it's the, the big concept is we now understand right colon cancer is different from left colon cancer. We can not treat them the same. And as shown here, it specifically says cetuximab for left sided tumors only not for right-sided tumors. So we cannot use EGFR inhibition for right-sided colon cancers uh, because they behave very, very differently from that of the left colon cancer. These kind of recognitions has allowed for us to select appropriate treatment for patients um, with specific cancers. Now, we also know microsatellite instability increases mutational burden. And as shown here, this is again NCCN guidelines for unresectable stage four colon cancer. If a patient has microsatellite instability, which means that they have increased tumor mutational burden, they're going to have increased immunogenicity, and that allows for them to be good candidates for PD-1 inhibitors, meaning immune checkpoint inhibitors, so that the white blood cells or the lymphocytes can actually act on these cancers. So the eligibility is presence of microsatellite instability high. Um, 
so very specific recommendations based on the tumor genotype and the mutational status of the tumor, not just for all patients. You know, they need to have, you know, are they BRAF wild type or BRAF mutated? Do they have microsatellite instability or high? All of these are common discussions when we talk about cancer care. So it's no longer a patient with stage three colon cancer. We don't say that anymore. We say it's a 65-year-old man with a right-sided colon cancer who is BRAF mutated and KRAS mutated um, with microsatellite stable colon cancer. So that is how we actually even describe this AJCC staging is probably going to be um, irrelevant in the next decade. It's already irrelevant for breast cancer. Um, it's going to be irrelevant for colon cancer as well. You know, it's good to know what their nodal staging is for certain reasons, but it's also more important to know what their mutational status is. Now, I've talked so much about genomics. I've talked about drugs, um, you know, targeted agents and so on. And I'm a surgical oncologist. I operate on people for a living. That's what I do. And I have pretty much talked about targeted agents and how to treat patients systemically. So the question, and I do want to talk about surgical advances. Now, has surgical advances really influenced outcomes in stage four colorectal cancer? And I do think the two big examples would be surgical resection for hepatic metastasis, and we will also talk about peritoneal carcinomatosis, which is my bread and butter. That's what I do. Now, surgical resection for hepatic metastasis, if you look at the historical perspective, this is a fascinating article that came out in 1989 by Dr. Silen. Um, and basically, he said, hepatic resection for metastasis from colorectal cancer is of dubious value. Um, and this came out in 1989 and really just said, it shouldn't be done. Morbidity is 25 to 30 percent. Mortality is 5 to 17 percent. And the estimated blood loss is over 3,000 ml. I mean, that's really uh, an impressive amount of blood loss when we lose less than a Coke can today to do liver resections, you know, less than a Coke can. You know, most of our patients do not get blood transfusion for uh, liver resections. And so this is another paper, that, you know, the next decade. And when we look at it, 1994, um, and they, uh, this is from Mayo Clinic Rochester, and they looked at the trends in morbidity and mortality for hepatic resection for malignancy. And they were able to show that there is a difference. You know, between 1976 to 1980, the mortality has gone down from 4.9% to 1.2%. Morbidity has gone down, and the transfusion rates have gone down. So which means that the surgeons are able to do the operation with less blood loss. Um, and definitely, the postoperative care of the patient also has significantly improved. How did this happen? Why are we able to reduce blood loss? You know, we have improved understanding of liver anatomy. We understand where the blood vessels actually run inside the liver. So it's not like random division of the liver, but knowing exactly where the inflow and outflow pedicles are. So um, very, um, you know, we, we know about the Queen Arts classification of liver anatomy and the sectors and where the blood vessels, the inflow and outflow blood vessels are. We also have advances in surgical technique. Now, this paper was published by Dr. Leslie Bloomgott, most of us who do liver resection uh, will have to know this name. Um, he essentially is considered to be the father of liver resection. Um, he, is in, uh, he was at Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, when he published this paper and essentially looked at their 100 consecutive hepatic resections. And they used low CVP and intermittent inflow occlusion, which is the Pringle maneuver where the inflow is occluded, allowing for decreased blood loss during the parenchymal division of the liver um, and ability to take out the outflows, which are the hepatic veins outside of the liver, even before the parenchymal division. So all of this resulted in lower blood loss. And, and this helped the surgeons who are doing liver resection really understand how to do liver resections well. And once again, Dr. Bloomgott's um, contribution to um, liver surgery is just remarkable. His books and his videos are just uh, amazing. Um, what a technically talented surgeon that he is. We also know how to divide liver better. Liver is a bag of blood. You know, you cut, it just bleeds. But we can cut through the entire liver with almost minimal blood loss is because we have advanced dissection techniques. We have fancy instruments, ultrasonic dissectors, harmonic stoppers, you know, radio frequency ablators, vascular staplers. We can get through liver parenchyma. In about 20 minutes, an entire right lobe can be divided with less than 100 cc blood loss with the kind of technique that we have right now. So the advances in surgical technique has allowed for us 
to take care of patients with hepatic metastasis really well. In addition, we understand the role of functional liver remnant. It is not just the size of the liver, but is it functional? And um, so for patients with normal liver, the amount of functional liver remnant required is just around 20. Whereas if the patient has steatosis, which is often seen in patients with cancer chemotherapy because they have steatohepatitis, the functional liver remnant required is a li little bit more. It's more than 30%. But if the patient truly has cirrhosis or very significant cholestasis, the functional liver rec remnant required will go up. It's more than 40%. So understanding the need, the size of or the, the amount of functional liver remnant that should be left behind after a liver resection has reduced the post-operative mortality, especially post-operative liver failure-related deaths. Um, so this is, again, an, a significant advancement. We are also capable of increasing the functional liver remnant. So if a patient doesn't have adequate liver remnant, we can use portal vein embolization to increase the liver remnant. So this is a patient who, who uh, underwent portal vein embolization, and you can see the size of the left segment, which really hypertrophies in a matter of a few weeks. Uh, you will see enormous enlargement of the liver. And same here, you know, and there is enlargement of the liver um, to a significant size. And this, these are techniques that we can use to enable or change a patient from a non-resection candidate to a resection candidate because we use techniques to increase their functional liver remnant and, and be able to do these operations very safely. So overall, liver resection has been shown to be beneficial. Um, and this is an, um, data from MSKCC, and they showed a median survival of 44 months, a cure rate, an actual cure rate of 17 to 25 percent. It depends upon the patient, the tumor biology, as well as the surgeon experience. And this is coming back to the, that particular article that I quoted initially uh, from Journal of Clinical Oncology. So they looked at trends in survival, and it tend to correlate with the increasing trends in liver resection. As the liver resection, the numbers, numbers of liver resection went up, the survival for patients with stage four um, metastatic, I mean, stage four colorectal cancer also went up. So surgical advances can improve outcomes in patients with stage four cancer. Finally, I just want to come to peritoneal carcinomatosis. I have a few more slides to go through. Um, now, surgical treatment for peritoneal carcinomatosis. This is probably the worst of the worst that we can care for. And these are patients with stage four colorectal cancer and probably the most complex patients to care for. What I am showing here, this is a patient of mine um, that I recently operated. And what you see here is peritoneal carcinomatosis tumor nodules, you know, diffuse dissemination of peritoneal carcinomatosis tumor nodules. You know, really, uh, there's disease everywhere in the abdomen. How do you? operate on these patients? What do you do to remove cancer in these patients? What works for them? Can we improve their survival? And you know, it's overall associated with poor survival, and it's a common site of failure in GI as well as gynecological cancer. Ovarian cancer tend to have peritoneal carcinomatosis, but not as, def you know, definitely for colorectal cancer, it becomes stage four, but for ovarian cancer, it's still a stage three C disease. Um, and this is a picture showing omental caking. Um, and I'm holding up a, a piece of omenta with multiple tumor nodules here. This is also a patient of mine um, who had extensive uh, carcinomatosis. Uh, now, from surgical advances, cytoreductive surgery was popularized by Dr. Sugar Baker, who um, said, you know, go in and remove all the cancer, right? So just take them all out is what he essentially did, which is called the cytoreductive surgery which involves removing the parietal peritoneum, removing the visceral peritoneum, multivisceral resections, followed by intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Um, um, so this is, you know, um, where, how we remove the peritoneum from the sidewall. It usually involves multivisceral resections. This is a diaphragmatic peritoneum with tumor nodules, spleen with tumor nodules. Um, so these patients go through a pretty big operation when we talk about cytoreductive surgery. But is there data to show that this actually works in these patients? And there is. You know, although these are very difficult patients to care for, there is good data to show. And this is a randomized control trial um, by Vic Weirwal, uh, published in 2008. And he showed that patients who were randomized to standard chemotherapy compared to cytoreduction and HIPAC, there was an improvement in overall survival, um, as well as, you know, um, 
when we look at the specifics of these patients, there was significant improvement in survival in patients who had all of their cancer removed. You know, if there was any cancer left behind, um, those patients did poorly. But if you are able to remove all the cancer, those patients tend to have a median survival even higher than 22.4 months, nearly 40 months. So this was their median survival. So this was, again, a landmark article that was published. And um, we recently have a more updated um, trial, which is the Prodigy 7, that looked at patients with peritoneal carcinomatosis. This is, again, a remarkable study, is because finally we are able to show improvement in survival. For patients with peritoneal carcinomatosis from colorectal cancer, a median survival of 41 months. Um, so th these are not patients who should be sent for palliative care. Uh, these are patients who should be considered for cytoreductive surgery. This is my last slide. Um, this is actually our own experience from Loma Linda. Um, we looked at about 125 of our patients between 2011 and 2017. Um, our grade three, four surgical complications were 8.8%. So we can do this operation really well with very low morbidity to the patient. Our 90-day mortality is 0%. And the median survival of these patients has not been reached. So majority, nearly 88% of the patients are still alive. And these are patients who we operated back in 2011 until 2017. So these patients do really well. Um, so the answer so are the questions. We are going to do the post-test questions, but we want people to respond to the questions. We're going to have them answer. We, we are going to do yes, the pre and the post do, questions? We're going to do the post. We are good, you guys going to do the post questions? Yeah. OK. So. Um, so the, the final thing is, stage four cancer, are we winning the battle? And I think it's an astounding yes, one day at a time. I think we are making a difference in stage four cancer. Before we answer the questions, I, we want the audience to actually answer them. So he has to upload something real quick okay, here sure. for you. Yeah, Sorry about yeah. that. No, 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 no problems. No so everybody problems. close their eyes. Don't, don't look at this answer. <laughs> I, I have this in my presentation. I have the three questions in my presentation. Oh, okay, all right. Ah, I see, I see. It's a poll. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So you are all answering now. Yep. They are. Okay. So the incidence of the following cancers are declining, except I was told that except questions are unacceptable in the American Board of Surgery questions anymore, but it's, it's all right. I like them. You have to stay awake. Oh my gosh, 100%. Keep waiting. How many minutes, I mean, how many seconds are we giving them? Okay. Next one. Dr. James Allison received the Nobel, sorry, it's spelled wrong, um, prize in 2018 for his discovery of BRAF mutation, MEK inhibitor, PD1, PDL1. Oh, wow. Okay. We'll wait for a few seconds. There's more responses. Very attentive group of audience. That's like 100% for CTLA-4. That's the right answer. Okay, moving on. 
checkpoint inhibitors facilitate tumor cell activity by increasing immune cell infiltration, releasing the breaks of T lymphocytes, dendritic cell activation, enhancing natural killer cell act Jesus. facilitating antigen release from the cancer cell. We're just waiting for a few more seconds for more responses to come in, and then we will move on to the next question. Yeah? Microsatellite instability in tumor predicts response to EGFR inhibition, BRAF inhibition, MEK inhibition, PD-1, PD-L1 inhibition, or VEGF inhibition. I had to actually check to see if it worked. Yeah. <laughs> so you, I see, I see. Okay. It works. It works, yeah. All right. Wonder, should I say the right answer or should I not? It's yes? It's correct. Okay. So PD1, PDL1 inhibition is because microsatellite instability increases the tumor mutational burden, and the tumor mutational burden in turn causes more. <laughs> yeah, change it. change it quickly, quickly, before, before it registers. So everyone has to get 100% MOC. Um, so there's more immune cells that infiltrate into the tumor, and then activating or releasing the breaks changes. So um, I'm using a pembrolizumab, as I showed in the NCCN guidelines, MSI high tumors is an indication to use either nivolumab or pembrolizumab. Both are PD-1 inhibitors. All right. Um, and I believe that is our last question. So right-sided colon cancer that is metastatic to the liver and wild-type KRAS can be treated with the following agents except by a few, babesuzumab, cetaximab, I don't know, TCAM, Oxaliplatin. How do we change on this? No. All right, very good. That is the correct answer. Cetaximab, you know, cannot be used. Even if the patients are wild-type KRAS, they will not respond to cetaximab, and actually you could cause more harm to those patients. Um, but in left-sided colon cancer, that would be appropriate to use cetaximab if they're wild-type KRAS. Okay, excellent. You know, I think that concludes my talk. I'll be happy to take a few questions. So thank you very much. We do have some time for questions. Here's a question right here. What about transverse colon adenocarcinomas? Good question. Actually, you know, it's interesting. So transverse colon cancer, except for splenic flexure, is actually classified into right colon cancer. So if it's splenic flexure, you know, just based on the embryological origin, you know, middle colic um, um, supply, so like two-thirds of the transverse colon belong to the right side, and the splenic flexure and distal are all left colon. That is how most of these classifications are classified, based on the embryological origin. So appendiceal cancers, even though they belong to right-sided colon cancer, we specifically exclude them from colon cancer. Appendix cancers are actually um, reported as appendix cancers and not as colon cancers. Now, appendix cancer itself is a whole different biological entity. You know, it's amazing as to how much we learn. The incidence of BRAF mutation, once again, is higher in appendix cancer, even higher than the BRAF mutations in the right-sided colon cancer. There is a higher incidence of BRAF in appendix. And appendix cancers are notoriously chemo-resistant. So when I see patients with appendix carcinomatosis, I just operate on them. 
I do not necessarily treat them with systemic therapy if it is a mucinous adenocarcinoma of the appendix. On the other hand, if they have a signet ring adenocarcinoma of the appendix, that is a different biology. And when we look at the genomic expressions of these cancers, um, they are very different based on the type of cancer cell you see. So appendix itself is a, a different entity altogether. Yeah, very interesting question. I mean, like we are um, really looking into this at more depth to say, how are these patients behaving so differently? And we find the mucinous tubers to be chemo resistant. Yeah. Other questions? Any other questions for Dr. Sento? Down here. Yes. 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 Well, so hyperthermic, so when we do do these major cytoreductive surgeries, you know, you can think about the entire abdomen is just filled with cancer. So the cytoreductive surgery, we are going in and removing all the cancers from the abdomen, after which we are also putting in heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy once all the cancer has been removed to kill the microscopic cancer cells. And there are different agents that you could use. Um, so, and the agents vary based on the type of cancer you're taking care of. Um, and the utility of hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy has not been independently studied until the Prodigy 7 trial. So we are having a lot of clinical trials now focusing primarily on heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Because Prodigy 7 trial, the latest trial I showed, even though it showed cytoreduction was beneficial, it did not show any significant difference with heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy using oxaliplatin for 30 minutes, right? So there is a lot more work that, is, that needs to be done for hypothermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy, but we know that based on the phase two studies, hypothermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy is effective in killing cancer cells. The type of drug, the flow, the temperature, the duration, all of that matters. And there's going to be a lot more clinical trials going to be coming out with this. And we have a couple. We have yeah. another question here. Yes. Is there anything to show with uh, intraperitoneal um, carcinoma, carcinoid tumors? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, um, there, are, there are a couple of, you know, we do cytoreductions or for any number of different indications. I just pointed out colorectal cancer. And carcinoid tumors are one such uh, tumors. And goblet cell carcinoid of the appendix is actually the more common one that we get to see, which is essentially an aggressive variant of an adenocarcinoma. And these cancers, when they spread to the abdomen, we will go in and try to reduce. For carcinoid tumors itself, if it is a limited disease, we can go in and remove all of the um, malignant carcinoid tumors from the abdomen. And a similar cytoreduction can be done for metastatic liver disease as well. So, you, you know, pretty much in the right, appropriately selected patient, you could use cytoreduction um, for the right indications, though. You know, you cannot do that on all patients. You have to have good indications. We yes. have another question yes. here. How about small bowel and carcinoid? So, uh, thank you for that question. I appreciate that. So, small bowel and carcinoid, um, Dr. Kirk, um, if, the, if the carcinoid itself spreads to the peritoneal surface, there is a possibility in the right patients to operate um, on them and remove the disease. But if it's extensive spread of carcinoid, you know, you, you have to choose the, um, the amount of disease that you're willing to cytoreduce. Uh, because these are the outside, kind of not the, the typical indication for cytoreductive surgery, but can be done. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Yes. Is there, is there any, any rhyme or reason to all these MAVs, MAVs, IBS, IBS, Oh, yeah. Monoclonal antibodies or MAVs and IBS. Um, oh, the inhibitors. They are all MEK inhibitors, um, BRAF inhibitors. So inhibitors have IB at the end. MABs are monoclonal antibodies. Yes. Yeah, not a problem. That's how we yeah. teach our medical students. If it's MAB, it's a monoclonal antibody. At least you can start off by saying it is a monoclonal antibody. You may not be able to fill the other half of it if you don't know it, but at least you will get half of the answer right. <laughs> well, Dr. Sento, thank you so much for your work. My pleasure, the, my pleasure. Uh, and in this, uh, you're giving us hope in the advances uh, in treatment of cancers. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.